Good afternoon, friends. Welcome back. Advent blessings to you and your family. Thank you for joining us again this Wednesday afternoon. Before we begin our service, just a couple of things we want to bring to your attention. First is, many thanks to all of you who have been so generous with your donation of food and warm weather wear these past weeks. Uh, the response has been incredible and very generous, and we thank you for that. It's going to be an enormous blessing to so many here in our area. Good news, if you would like to make a donation, these giving opportunities continue throughout the month of December. We are supporting the New Life Center and the Inn with the food and with the warm weather clothing. And donations can be dropped off outside the church doors anytime. We check the doors often. And also you can bring them with you when you're here for service. Again, thank you for your generosity. Another item of good news, if you are enjoying our midweek services now, we look forward to bringing that back in January. We will continue our midweek prayer services. We look forward to this and our time of worship together today. And as we prepare our hearts for our coming Savior, we are reminded that with God, all things are possible. And with that hope and with that joy, we open with our first hymn. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. The light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening. And the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness. And Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ. We have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We Sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with your voices forever. O oh, Son of God, O oh, 
Our first reading is from Psalm 132. Arise, O Lord, and go to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness, and let your saints shout for joy. For the sake of your servant David, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. The Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back. One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and my testimonies that I shall teach them, their sons also forever shall sit on your throne. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provisions. I will satisfy her poor with bread. Her priests I will clothe with salvation, and her saints will shout for joy. There I will make a horn to sprout for David. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but on him his crown will shine. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The second reading is from the book of Isaiah, the seventh chapter. Again the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. He, will, he shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse evil and choose the good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The gospel reading is according to St. Luke, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Christ. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child is to be born, will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Mary and Joseph are probably one of the most famous couples in history. I mean, it's got to be pretty close, right? They're up there. I mean, they're part of the nativity scene, and the nativity scene is a staple of the entire month of December. I mean, you could ask non-Christians, do you know who Mary and Joseph are? And I would bet some of them would probably say yes. Mary and Joseph, they're famous. 
And last week we talked about Zechariah and Elizabeth and these two figures, how they reacted to the news of Jesus. Now we talk about Mary and Joseph. How did they react when they received the news of Jesus? And how does their reaction, how does it inform us for our response to the news of Jesus? Mary was a young virgin from the town of Nazareth. And she is very right when she sings in her song, All generations will call me blessed. Because here we are 2,000 years later calling her the Blessed Virgin Mary. We know this scene very well. The angel Gabriel appears to Mary. And Gabriel, he probably requested overtime from the boss upstairs because here he is again, first speaking to Zechariah and now to Mary. Gabriel, he brings news. Oh, favored one, you will conceive and bear a son, and that son will be the very Son of God. Last week we talked about Old Testament prophecies being fulfilled, the wait finally being over. Well, here we see it again. As Isaiah says, the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel, which you and I know means God with us. And so Mary hears this news. And sometimes we hear this story so many times we gloss over the details. But this is life-changing news. The angel Gabriel is coming and saying, hey, in nine months, I know you weren't expecting it, but you're going to have a kid. Out of the blue. And not with a kid you were expecting to have one with, with Joseph, but the Holy Spirit would fill you, and you would conceive miraculously. How easy would it be to object to these things? And yet Mary recognizes her role as a humble servant of God. And how does she respond to this news of Jesus? With obedience. She says, let it be done as you say. Mary was engaged when this news came, and she miraculously conceived while she was engaged. Now, when we think of engaged nowadays, it's a little bit different than how it was in ancient Israel. When you were engaged in ancient Israel, you were basically legally married. Mary would call Joseph her husband, And Joseph would call Mary his wife while they were engaged. Engagement engagement in ancient Israel was marriage minus sharing a bed, essentially. So you can imagine what Joseph's reaction would be when he finds that his wife is pregnant with a child that clearly isn't his. Joseph was a simple carpenter. But more importantly, he was a descendant of King David. And we talk about this all the time. Why is that important? Well, King David was promised by God that one of his descendants would establish his kingdom forever. God says that I will be to him a father and he will be to me a son. Well, here we see the virgin conceives and bears a child, and that child is born into the household of David, God keeps his promises. The Old Testament prophecies are fulfilled. But Joseph, he doesn't know any of this. When he looks at Mary, he sees his wife pregnant with a child that is not his. And I'm pretty sure his first first thought was not, oh, this is a miraculous conception. Joseph, can you you imagine his reaction? How he might feel betrayed, saddened, even we can understand him feeling furious and angry. Joseph is in full right. He could go out to the town and say, my wife has committed the sin of adultery. You know what the punishment for adultery is? Deuteronomy, it, it says it pretty clear. If there is a betrothed virgin and a man meets her in the city and lies with her, then you should bring them both out to the gate of that city. 
and you shall stone them to death with stones. Joseph is in full right. He could do that. But Joseph is a man who values grace and compassion over condemnation. Sounds like someone else that you and I know. He decides that because Mary has, well, he perceives that Mary has committed a sin of unfaithfulness, that he would divorce her secretly so that she would not have to face the capital punishment and so that she would not be put to shame. What compassion Joseph shows when he could feel very much betrayed in that moment. And, and one detail that gets brushed over as well, the compassion goes even farther. Because if he did rat out Mary for this perceived sin, he could rightfully claim her dowry. He could reclaim the bridal fee he paid for marrying Mary. And yet, he takes the financial hit himself. He plans to divorce, divorce her secretly so that she can keep her possessions. This is the compassion that Joseph shows, yet Joseph is about to do the wrong thing for the right reasons. But as you and I know, God gets involved. An angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a vision, and it, we don't know who that angel is. If it's Gabriel, he deserves a raise, all right? But he appears to Joseph and says, do not be afraid Take Mary as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and that son will save his people from their sins. Oh, okay. And Joseph, just like that, 180-degree change, throws out plans to divorce his wife and sacrifices his time, his effort to support this child that isn't even his, to support the child that he's been commanded to support, to be obedient to what God says. Perhaps this is why Mary and Joseph are so revered, right? That they show such humble obedience with such bizarre circumstances. Last week, you and I talked about how we know all this. We have, we have the benefit of hindsight. We know that the story of Mary and Joseph, it, it works out in the end, right? Because we, we have it right here. We have the story. We know that Mary and Joseph raised their son up. They raised the true son of God. And that the son of God begins his ministry and he goes out and he does save his people from their sins, just as Gabriel told Joseph, by dying on a cross for all our sins, and that we are his people, adopted into his family by our baptisms. We know it all works out, because we've got the news of Jesus right here in the Bible. How will you respond to this news? Well, perhaps we should follow the example of Mary and Joseph being obedient to the Most High God. Well, how are we obedient to our God in heaven? Well, this is why Lutherans like to teach the Ten Commandments, right? The commands that God has given us. Do not sin, do not bear false witness, do not steal, do not murder, do not commit adultery. These commands, as children of God, we are shaped by these things. You know, and, and Jesus says in John, if you love me, you will follow my commandments. You will obey my commandments. And when we think about love, I think it's only a partial look at things when you think of love as the hearts, hugs and kisses, Valentine's Day image of love, right? But love is more than that. Love, it involves sacrifice. Sacrifice. 
to obey God's commands is hard. It goes against our sinful natures to not do the things that we honestly really, really want to do. As Paul says, we tear off our old selves and put on someone new. We are made new by the blood of Jesus. The perfect act of love, the greatest act of love, is when someone lays down their life for their friends. We see Jesus committing the very greatest act of love by dying on a cross for us, by saving us from all our sins. And so you and I, as we love our God, what does it mean to love our God, to love our neighbor, to give up our life of sin for him? And this, this is very hard, right? This is, this is, some people give up. They read the Ten Commandments and they laugh and say, ha, I'm not doing that. I'll use, I'll use Jesus as the get out of jail free card. You know, the, the, this is the cheap grace mentality, right? That I'll use him to feel good about myself when I sin, but I'm not really going to change how I live. Where's the sacrifice? What, what kind of love is that? But if we truly love our God, we will sacrifice like Mary and Joseph sacrificed, throwing our original plans to live in sin away, but living in a way according to what God commands. And I'm not asking you to be perfect. <laughs> the good luck with that, right? This is why Jesus came in the first place, right? To redeem us from our sins. But maybe it's our failed attempts to keep the law that makes our sacrifice so significant. If we were perfect and obeyed the law perfectly, then obeying God's commands would be the average Tuesday. But because you and I can acknowledge that this law we're never going to be able to keep it perfectly. We're never going to be able to keep the Ten Commandments perfectly. We've already failed. And yet, we try to anyway? Isn't that what love is? To sacrifice our old way of life. The way of life that our world supports and encourages us to claim. We cast it aside because we love our God. In our obedience to God's commands, we sacrifice. We sacrifice the old way of life. This is what it means to follow Mary and Joseph's example, because we are simply humble servants of our God. Humble servants of our God who have better plans than much of the world, we have a hope greater than any other hope. We have the hope that death is not the end, but that Jesus will raise us to new life with him, that our sins are forgiven. And now we go and act like it. We go and act like transformed people of God. From top, from top to bottom, we have been made So go, brothers and sisters, be obedient to your God. Sacrifice your old life because you love him so much. And live in that hope that the Son of God truly did come and that he truly did save his people from their sins, that you and I are saved and that we will see Jesus in paradise forever. Amen.
nations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things to me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent empty away. He has helped his servant Israel in the remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Let us pray. As the fulfillment of our hope draws near, let us pray for the church, the world, and all people according to their needs. Holy God, who prepared the way of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world, we give you thanks for your abiding faithfulness to us. Prepare our hearts by repentant faith and heal our blinded sight for Christ's glorious return. Pour out your grace into our hearts and set our minds on the path of compassion for one another and renew us with joy to serve one another in peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for those who rule and govern your people in every land. Give your spirit to those who lead our country, that they may be trustworthy, wise, and serve with equity towards the general welfare of all people. Grant your protection to those who serve in the military, all law enforcement officers, first responders, and firefighters. Continue to strengthen and preserve all doctors and nurses and all who serve in medical vocations, and bless all those who are working diligently to research and produce a vaccine and safe treatments to halt the spread of this pandemic. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Compassionate Father, help your suffering people, the hungry, the poor, the unemployed, the sick, the dying, the grieving, and all who are anxious of heart. We pray especially today for Gina Stevens and all those listed on our prayer guide. We also lift before you all those in our hearts now. Graciously give them all they need for their well-being and quiet their fears with your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, grant to us health of both mind and body, that we may love you with our whole heart and with all of our strength, and perform those things that are pleasing to you. Daily increase our faith towards you and guide us in humble service for one another. 
Grant that by your Holy Spirit, we may proclaim the good news of our Savior's birth, whose perfect submission in life and death and victorious resurrection made it possible for us to receive the gift of salvation and everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Savior, Jesus Christ, whose advent is near. Amen. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God, the almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Bless us and preserve us now and forever. Amen. Amen. We conclude with our closing hymn, Jesus Came, the Heavens Adore. Serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.